Thank you very much for having me. After I was listening to this morning's presentations, I was struck by Dean Clinchot's images, and I decided that next winter, Chicago better have more snow, and I'm going to give my daughter a shovel, put her out there, take a bunch of pictures, and hopefully after I show those kinds of slides, every one of our students is going to love our assessment system and love our portfolio. So it doesn't take much, right? Um, so I'm, thank you again for, for letting me speak today, and I'm going to speak more about what Dr. Clinchot referred to as the system that you build to collect assessments and make summative decisions, including entrustment decisions. Um, so let me start with what the mission statement is for Feinberg's portfolio-based assessment system. And it really is about developing reflective, inquiry-driven learners who learn how to do self-improvement, and also to provide a means by which we feel confident that we can make summative decisions for some of the competencies that are harder to measure, behaviorally-based competencies like communication, teamwork, professionalism. This is what we tell our students that our portfolio uh, is about, that first and foremost, it is uh, a method or means by which they should be able to develop their own reflective capacity and self-directed assessment and improvement capacity, but also that it can uh, permit formative and summative assessment for competence. So Feinberg is a uh, school in downtown Chicago. It ha we have about 170 students per class, 165 to 170 students per class. And in uh, 2005, we developed our own competency compass. Um, you'll recognize the six ACGME competencies that are embedded here. And we actually added two competencies that were important for the Feinberg community, which are community engagement and service and personal awareness and self-care. And just to especially orient um, uh, maybe some who are less familiar with it, each of our competencies have sub-competencies. This is not new. Some people call them standards. Some people call them sub-competencies. They are the behaviorally, and, and behaviorally oriented and measurable uh, standards beneath each of the headings that will allow us to decide whether a student is making progress appropriately um, along their curriculum. We decided to uh, base our assessment at Feinberg on a portfolio system. And we did that deliberately because we recognized that the measurement of complex competencies is very challenging and requires a, uh, an ability for a system to collect multiple tools over time and to um, allow judgment to be applied to those assessment tools to make decisions. But more importantly, I think, and even I tell our students this, that even if all we did was help students develop reflective capacity, I think we'd be successful. Um, and you know, a portfolio really allows them to engage daily, I don't think they do it daily, um, but it allows them to engage regularly with their assessment material in a way that's facilitated by mentors and helps them to understand their performance. So uh, our approach is that students have access to their portfolio of assessment data. Um, it is both uh, it, uh, data that is driven and collected by the uh, school, the majority of it is, but the student also has the capacity to upload different assessments into the portfolio that there were different, different documents or artifacts, such as an H&P that they think is particularly exceptional or an abstract or something like that. They can, they can upload that material into their own portfolio and provide that for demonstration of achievement. Um, the students are expected to write reflective essays about their progress in each of our competency domains, um, and they do that every six months. And they have to support their statements of where they are in terms of their achievement, but based on the evidence that they have in their assessment portfolio. One of the um, key lessons that I've learned and that I think has been um, borne out in the literature on portfolios is that if you do not have committed and active mentors <clears throat> to guide your students in this process, uh, you won't engage the students. And so I'll share a little bit more about how we've uh, done that. 
And our mentors meet with our students every six months to review their performance data. Um, they help our students understand their data. They talk the student who has one negative peer comment about respect from the ledge and talk them down and say you have 50 comments that tell that you're a wonderful participant in group discussions. And at the same time, they also point out to the student, you know, when you were late five times over the last few months, this is something that's a problem. And you need to recognize that and address it and let's figure out how you're going to not have that happen anymore. So having our mentors be part of that is key. But we have built in a summative judgment into the portfolio process, and I'll um, tell you more about that in a moment. The whole um, portfolio is based on really Van der Vluten's principles of programmatic assessment, which for those of you who haven't read it, I, I doubt there's many in the audience here, um, it was very seminal in how we think about assessment at Northwestern. The system that you design has to drive learning, and for us, it has to collect multiple different types of assessment tools, um, collected over time in different contexts and by different evaluators. We would truly believe that that paints a much more credible and valid picture of student performance than any one type of assessment collected um, on multiple times. I think the, um, uh, one of the key points is that the stakes that are applied to any decision, the key one ultimately being entrustment, it has to be proportional to the number of observations and assessments that are present. And I, I actually, in the last uh, few years, have been thrilled to see that um, despite the importance of psychometric reliability coefficients, um, that we are welcoming more judgment into the decisions about competence and achievement of our, of our students and our learners. I think what we do in medicine is way too complex to be able to reduce it to you know, something that on, on multiple occasions has a reliability coefficient of 0.8. I, I, I think there is more to it than that, and, and the literature is supporting that. The judgment, the know it when you see it, or the comment that someone made earlier about the gestalt Adultism, I think you referred to the word, um, is actually really an okay thing and that there are other measures of validity that you can apply in that setting. And we've embraced that. So this is our curriculum. We too went through a curriculum renewal in 2009. We have three phases. Phase 1A and 1B is the traditional M1, M2 year. Phase 2 is the traditional clerkship M3 year, and Phase 3 are the advanced clerkships. And you can see that we have three elements, science and medicine, clinical medicine, and professional development that are um, uh, uh, presented in different proportions throughout the three phases. We do have a traditional pass-fail grading system in the first two years, and then in the third year, we have honors, high pass, pass, and fail for our clerkships. And so this traditional grading system, the way the grades are calculated in the first and second year is using quantitative um, a collection of ratings tools, OSCE performance, a big portion of it is multiple choice exam performance, um, written products, and those are then put together in a composite score where standard setting happens and a cut fail uh, pat, um, score is created below which the students will fail and above which the students will pass. But again, that's on quantitate with quantitative numbers. Uh, it does not really get at the narrative, deep, rich data that might say something about a student's professionalism or communication or teamwork skills. And so what we've built alongside this is the parallel portfolio assessment system. And, and as I mentioned, in every six months from the beginning when the students arrive, they meet with their mentors for formative portfolio review where only the mentor and the student has access to the data, to the student's reflections and the student's learning plans. And then at the end of phase one, before clerkships start, and then again at the end of phase two, after clerkships start, we have a summative portfolio review where judgment is applied to the student's performance over time. I think the importance of this and the hallmark of this was my work in the, when I moved into the dean's office and sat with, a, I think most of you will be able to resonate with this, and sat with a third year student who was having trouble in a clerkship. And you look back and you actually see plenty of 
clues that this person was going to have a problem with communication. But because there was no ability to longitudinally collect that information and have someone make a decision or apply a judgment to it, we did not intervene and help that student at that time. And so that was sort of the hallmark of thinking about this in a different way. And I do think that our portfolio process allows us to do that. Not perfectly, but um, I'll share that. So what is in the portfolio? What, is, what kinds of assessment data do we have in there? I think pretty typical of most institutions. Faculty and peer evaluations of small group work. We have clinical performance evaluations. Our students start with in a longitudinal preceptorship at week one of medical school. We have some direct observation, um, not robust direct observation, which is why we're working with My Progress now as well. We have feedback from standardized patients in our OSCEs. We have some written work products. And, and what is key is really, as, as the gentleman from emergency medicine mentioned, um, that the narrative data is essential to be able to provide true feedback to our students, for students to be able to understand what's going on. One of the hardest parts for any institution that's going um, into this is to actually develop the equivalent of milestones or benchmarks of performance. And we did that with groups of faculty that were each assigned to a competency domain. We included students, we included residents, we included allied health professionals, nurses, pharmacists, and they created these set sets of anchors for each of the sub-competency and each of the competency domains and made decisions about where the student should be at the end of phase one and at the end of phase two, um, and then at, at graduation. Obviously, I think for those of you who've done this, this is an iterative process, and we already have gone through a revision of this. I think we underestimated the achievement levels of our students, and we've now kind of ratcheted up a little bit, so adjusted our benchmarks appropriately, um, and, and maybe combined some standards that we realized were redundant. Each of the assessment tools at Feinberg is mapped to the competency substandards, and you'll see that here. We also have, this is just an example of an individual assessment tool. This is a, a mid-year clinical um, evaluation. And then the yellow bar is where that benchmark corresponds to the competency benchmark that I just showed you on the previous slide. So faculty are triggered a little bit to expect where the students should fall. As you all know, many faculty think our students walk on water and will always give them eights and nines, even though the last thing that we could say is that evaluating teamwork in a PBL setting is far from a complex situation and just tells us the faculty aren't actually reading the anchors. So I think that's in part why everyone has challenges with the quantitative rating system uh, alone. Um, when uh, we have an assessment, for example, in communication or in teamwork, it doesn't matter where it occurs. So it could be communication in a, in a clinic setting. It could be communication in a PBL setting. It could be communication on a direct observation. If it's a listening standard or if it's a sharing information standard, they're all mapped to one of our uh, sub-competencies in effective communication and interpersonal skills. It's collected in our portfolio, and the first way a student can look at that information is in this student dashboard. And you'll see, for example, on the uh, expectations column, gives the students a sense of how many of their assessments are above benchmark, exceed or above benchmark, and the little yellow warning sign, which the first year we did this, the students, of course, were like, oh my god, that's horrible, there's four warning signs. After a while, they recognize and they start to just say, you know, it's just really a, a place for you to look. It's not, it's not telling you anything horrible about you, and they've calmed down a little bit. Um, but if a student wants to, or if a mentor wants to drill down, they click on that particular competency, and then they can see the sub-competencies, and to the right of that, in the second column, you can see all of the evaluations or assessments that are mapped to that particular sub-competency. And then the yellow warning sign tells you this is the assessment where the student was below benchmark. And then I don't have a slide of this, but the next, uh, the next uh, drill down is you actually click on that assessment itself and it opens up the assessment tool. Um, so it allows the students, it allows us to organize their assessments along competency domains and allows the students to look at their performance across competencies, not just by, you know, PBL or clinical 
uh, and preceptorship, et cetera. As I mentioned, we do require our students to write reflective um, narratives about their performance. We have a space in our portfolio that does this, so there's a formative reflections tab across the top. Again, our formative reflections happen every six months and are only seen by the mentor, the student's mentor, and the student themselves. No one in the dean's administration and no one on the summative portfolio committee has access to that. We believe very strongly in the firewall between the mentor and the student who's supporting, the mentor who's supporting that student to allow for the freedom of, you know, all of the anxiety about getting a negative evaluation to occur and the student's insight into that. But at the time that they submit their summative reflections, which again happen at the end of phase one, and again at the end of phase two, that reflection is visible by the summative committee. The students are also expected uh, during these six month formative meetings to create learning plans. And you know, for most of the students, I think everyone in the audience can relate to this, people are usually doing fine. And what, what a good mentor will do is help those students understand in which domains are you doing well enough that you want to excel, what's personally important to you, that you want to be more than competent and you want to excel. And so helping students move to that level is just as important as identifying and helping the student with deficiencies. So they have to create learning plans. Um, I, I thought I, I'd mention for a moment that uh, a little bit about our mentor system. Our students, about 165 students, are divided into four colleges. Each college is led by a mentor. So that means that mentor has about 40 to 45 students. And that mentor is responsible for the review of that portfolio for 45 students. It's a lot. It's a lot of work. The mentors are compensated. They are um, supported with faculty development. We meet with them monthly. We put them through a coaching curriculum, which I'll admit could be a little more robust, and our attention will be this year to make it a little more robust. But we, we help the mentors, and it's probably the equivalent of um, a 25% FTE job for them, 20%, 25%. Um, and as I said, they are supported. <clears throat> You know, what I've described here with the dashboard um, would really just be an assessment portfolio if we didn't add the reflective piece. And I think truly to make it a meaningful portfolio, that is the most important aspect, um, at least for me. Um, I'd love to see some literature on whether we're actually making any impact in the ability to develop reflective practitioners with portfolio systems. I have not seen a lot out there that talks about the measurement of that capacity, and if any of you are aware of it, I'm, I'm very interested in learning more about that. I think that would be a wonderful thing that we could do for our students if we, if we were successful with that. So a little more about the summative portfolio review, which gets at sort of these ultimate entrustment equivalent decisions, right? Um, you know, we do, you'll see here, these are the five competencies that we subject to summative portfolio review. You'll see that medical knowledge is missing. It's deliberately missing. We don't believe that you have to use a portfolio or judgment for medical knowledge assessment. Personal awareness and self-care is missing because the last thing I'm going to do is make a summative decision about a student's ability to seek help or therapy if they're struggling in something. And, and sadly, community engagement and service is missing. And I say sadly very deliberately because I have to tell you that Despite many years of having that on our competency compass, we have not built enough assessments to feel that we truly have the ability to make a summative decision about a student's advocacy or understanding of the community's needs. Um, and that's a deficit for us. But it highlights that one of the things that is essential is the only sub-competencies that we actually evaluate they need to have at least 10 robust types of assessments before we're, we're allowing a summative judgment to be made about them. So the portfo summative portfolio committee is made up of four to six faculty member, depending on which phase. They're experienced clinicians. They've had experience in medical education, um, either as uh, uh, fellowship directors or program directors or former clerkship directors, and in some case, former mentors who have worked with students in a formative way before. 
Each portfolio is reviewed by at least two committee members, um, and they look at the entire contents of the portfolio. So people have written about whether or not students should put forward their best work, and they've had mentors sort of sign off that the material is representative of a student's performance. We deliberately did not do that, both because, and I think that was the right decision um, after three years of experience with this, um, both because I think the ability of a mentor to truly be objective about a student they've been working with so closely for two to three years, um, I'm skeptical about. And secondly, um, you know, we really, one of the purposes of our portfolio was to demonstrate achievement of competence. So to feel like there was potentially material that was not available to the summative committee about a student's performance didn't meet that need very well. <clears throat> the student, uh, the committee also looks at the quality of the reflections and learning plans. One of our competencies is continuous learning and quality improvement, ability to accept and give and ex uh, understand feedback, and they do that largely through the quality of the reflections. We hold several training sessions with uh, standard setting to try to get to a joint consensus of meaning about performance in uh, about the portfolios. Trying, we review portfolios together uh, to to get to a, a shared understanding of performance, and then we train uh, the reviewers to look for patterns and for improvement over time. So this is just a schematic of what happens on the first review, which was two years ago. We had 156 students. They submitted a summative reflection. Each portfolio was reviewed by two raters. If they agreed, a third rating did not happen, a third review. If they disagreed, a third review occurred. And then uh, all of us met again at the end, predominantly to discuss the students where concerns were or those students that might need remediation. The decisions that were made that the committee assigns at the end of this process is progressing towards competence, progressing towards competence with concern, progressing towards competence with remediation, pending remediation. So one of the things I'll share with you here, just as a lessons learned piece, is we kind of were trying to sell this a little to the students, to, especially at the phase two one, which again is for the clerkships. So we all know of the student that doesn't perform well on tests and therefore might miss an honors grade in a clerkship, but they're wonderful team members, they're wonderful communicators, they're highly professional, and that student may not get the honors grade because they don't do well on the shelf exam. And so we were hoping, okay, well this process might allow us to show um, excellence in a certain competency domain. And we asked initially last year our raters to be able to also include a decision about progressing towards competence with excellence or with demonstrated excellence. Well, pretty quickly after that, our students started talking about, well, why did you get excellence and why didn't I get excellence and what? how many positive comments had to happen before a person got excellence? And it became so reduced to the grade on the portfolio than, uh, than the actual process about understanding why somebody thought they did particularly well that we got rid of it. We felt it just undermined what we were trying to do in getting students to understand their performance, not in relationship to grades. I think the strongest system, if we could ever get there as a group of, of um, medical schools would be if we got rid of grades. Um, I really believe that's the, uh, where, we're headed, where we could be headed and, and I would be happy to see that. In phase two, the um, evidence that's in the portfolios is uh, similar to phase one, but a little bit more with, uh, in the, because the clinical domains are there. So we have the clerkship grades and narratives. We have both the above the line comments that go into the dean's letter or MSPE. We have the below the line comments that the clerkship directors provide. We have the clinical performance evaluation comments from each faculty member that the portfolio reviewers and the students can see. We've actually provided a summary of our OSCE, so each of our clerkship has an OSCE, and then our clinical skills leader has actually combined the scores from the seven OSCEs in four domains, communication, um, history taking, physical exam, and clinical reasoning. So a summary score of seven OSCEs is included in that summative portfolio. We have direct observations. They are weak. They are not. They are mostly checkboxes. They have not had a lot of rich narrative data. Um, we're hoping that will change with the rollout of my progress, and I'll say more about that in a moment. 
We have used 360 evaluations for both um, patients and nurses, which um, in this, again, this is in the clinical setting, which we include in the portfolio. And then we have some interclerkship assessment that on teamwork and different self-assessment things that are called SAM and IC2s. So as I think I've heard many people talk about struggling with trying to develop a way to collect more narrative workplace-based assessment, truly direct observation, especially if we move towards EPAs, which by definition, EPAs are happening in the workplace. So, and we all know that the student who can do something in the sim lab is not necessarily the student who can do it when they see in the setting of a, of a family member who's distraught or a patient who's upset or whatever else it is. So to truly be able, I think to move towards EPA-based assessment, we have to have a more robust ability to understand our students' performance in the workplace. So this is our equivalent of the My Progress app, um, Assess Now. We were, I was very excited when we found My Progress. And our hope is that, you know, utilizing this app, I think as everybody is thinking about, if the faculty or the student have it on their phone and in the moment that the individual preceptor or, you know, the student can be with a patient on rounds in the morning and hand their phone over to the faculty. And even if that faculty just watched the student do a cardiac exam or just watched the student do a portion of the history or counseling, then that can be collected. It doesn't have to be the entire h and I think that's been prohibited in terms of collecting the right amount of data. Um, the app works really well. Um, we have not deployed it, but we've tried it. It'll be deployed in two weeks for our first clerkship, um, and we're excited to see what happens, and I'm curious to hear from others who are here who are going to tell us a little bit about their experience with this. So I'm hoping it's going to be the, um, the panacea for the problems of workplace-based assessment. One of the other interesting things is when we actually decided to pilot this, we did it in three clerkships, neurology, surgery, and um, OBGYN. And our surgery clerkship director wanted the, um, an assessment to actually be like a tracking tool. So at the end of two weeks, a faculty member fills out a performance evaluation on a student. And again, as we've all experienced, those of us, I mean, I just worked with students now, if I didn't write down my observations that day of what that student did, I would never be able to retrieve that at the two-week time period and to be able to provide truly rich, meaningful data. But the problem is I think most faculty don't write it down. I mean, we know that both from students and peers and everybody. We don't write down the observations. We trust our faulty memories to be able to give us a good gestalt of our student performance. And it's very weak, and it doesn't help our students in understanding their performance. So our surgery clerkship director wanted to build an, a form that's almost like a tracking app. And, and so that we have built this in my progress. And we are have the different domains that the evaluator will fill out at the end uh, of the two weeks of working with the student. And hopefully at the end of a day, the evaluator can just talk into their phone and actually collect whatever observations they have seen on the student at that time. Now, one of the, the wonderful things that My Progress has been able to do with us is all of the information from the app is actually directly being downloaded and communicated into our portfolio system. So when a faculty member will actually dictate something about an observation into this tracking form for surgery, that will automatically stay on, this, on the phone. And then, so collected over time, at the end when the faculty member has to fill it out, they can edit that information. And then it will sync when the faculty member hits submit right to the portfolio. And that's true for the direct observations for us too. As soon as they're submitted, they will sync right to our portfolio, allowing for that both formative and summative decisions to be made by the student mentor and the portfolio committee when a time comes. Um, this is just an image, again, if all I could collect was narrative feedback, I'd be happy. Um, I don't think my portfolio reviewers would love that, but I'd be happy. So some of the general concepts about our system is that really assessment of competence is not about the numbers. It's really about the narrative qualitative data that's included and we have to create systems that collect that kind of information about uh, complex performance in our students. And it is totally allowable, in my opinion, to allow for credible judgment to be applied to decisions about performance. 
Um, in a few minutes, I'd like to share a little bit of our outcomes. We've now done this for two years. Um, in phase one, our first review was in 2014. You can see here we had 156 portfolios reviewed, um, uh, four clinician reviewers. We've expanded that to six this past year because of the amount of volume of material they were looking at. Um, about 80% of the students had no concerns or remediation. 27 of the students, or 17%, had at least one progressing with concern noted in a clerkship. I'm, I'm sorry, in a prior to starting clerkships. And then only four students required remediation. Um, in phase two, the numbers are a little different. There were more students that required remediation, in large part because if a student received a concern in phase one, what that meant for the student is they had to meet with their mentor and develop a self-directed learning plan. But we did not subject them to formal remediation. Um, we're rethinking that, and we don't have the resources necessarily to do that for 31 students. But at the same time, uh, until we actually uh, analyze our outcomes data, it doesn't make sense for us to just be identifying these problems and not actually impacting student performance as they move along. So um, we really need to look carefully at what whether we're helping our students through this process or not. Um, and then if a student got concern, again, it's self-directed remediation. If they got concern in that same competency domain at phase two, then they had to undergo formal remediation. So they either were bad enough to require remediation up front or they were concerned in two domains. Um, these are just, this is a schematic of some of the competency domains that um, were pulled out of the summative portfolio review where concerns occurred. Professionalism is PBMR, that was the highest number, this is at phase one. Communication is the second highest number, that's ECIS. Um, the numbers don't add up to the slide before because some students had to remediate in more than one competency domain. In phase two, um, you'll see communication issues became a little bit more uh, prominent and professionalism went down a little bit. I think most of us would, uh, would argue that students actually will show up on time more for clerkships than they do in the pre-clerkship years. Um, interestingly, as this process has been going on, we've started collecting data from this year's phase one portfolio and our professionalism problems have gone down. So I think we're, we're creating a culture change maybe a little bit. Students are recognizing that we're monitoring those kinds of uh, behaviors and responding. Um, we, you know, one of the most important things in portfolio-based assessment is actually to demonstrate that you're measuring something valid. Um, and what we have uh, started to do, and have not published this yet, but hope to soon, is to actually look at our performance outcomes in the third year of the students that we found who had concerning behavior in the portfolio review in the first and second year. And we have found a significant association between the results of the portfolio review in phase one and clerkship performance in phase two, even after we've controlled for medical knowledge. So here is an um, a image of that. We've shown, we looked at two outcome measures, one of which was just the um, median number of clerkship grades awarded by the group. So you'll see that students who had any concerning behavior, either a progressing with concern or required remediation, had statistically significantly fewer honors grades in clerkships than students who had PCs or remediation. Not terribly surprising, but adds to the validity. The high pass group was equivalent, but again, over on, on the right, the pass group, were, there were over-representation of students who had concerning behavior seen in phase one. We also tried to control for medical knowledge. So we controlled for USMLC step one score and took out a, we developed a performance score called the mean clerkship performance score that excluded performance on shelf exams. So all we had in this mean clerkship performance score was clinical performance evaluation, OSCE scores, and professionalism evaluations. So granted, medical knowledge is part of all of that. There's no question that that's a piece of it, but trying to control more for these behaviorally based competencies, we created this score. And we actually showed again that the students who had concerning behavior had a slightly lower mean clerkship performance score in phase two. It doesn't look like a big number. When I first saw this, I'm like, yeah, okay, so what? This is, you know, 79.4 to 82.3. But in actuality, um, this actually could be the difference between a letter grade and a clerkship from a high pass to an honors or a pass to a high pass. 
So what, what we've demonstrated, I think, initially, it's, it's small numbers, um, is that there may be some validity to what we're measuring in phase one because it's actually predicting performance in phase two. Um, lastly, I'll just spend a few minutes on the challenge we're all facing with competency-based assessment and why I think EPAs are gaining such um, traction. I think everybody can recognize that the domains overlap, and we have that problem when we look at summative portfolio review, and you know, our committee members are saying, is this a teamwork problem, or is this a communication problem, and you know, we have to really grapple a little bit, and really that's ultimately not the most helpful thing is to try to reduce this into individual competencies, but actually to look at the overlap. And I think that's where EPAs fit in. And we have not moved to true EPA measurement at this point. We're about to start, and we're imagining <clears throat> that overlaying our current competency-based portfolio system. So you can see competencies will map to a particular EPA. And then clearly what's most important is the types of assessments that are collected in each of those domains that actually will support summative entrustment decisions for each EPA. And those assessments at the bottom should also include sort of ad hoc EPA assessments for or direct observations. Again, somewhere where I think an app like My Progress can come in handy. Um, we did not, we struggled in thinking that an M1 learner, a phase one learner, should actually be measured along EPAs. I think we can all under, uh, uh, sort of, the way I think about it is, well, I might decide that a student is entrustable to perform a history and physical, even though he or she may have had some communication problems, but ultimately the overall gestalt is they can do it. But they might have not been, you know, as patient-centered as I would like them or as, as empathic as I'd like them to be. And it's not unless I look at all of the performance over time in that particular domain of communication skill that I'm concerned about that I'm going to be able to pick that up. So one of the things we felt was important is actually to continue with our competency-based assessment system for phase one and, and to maybe introduce the language of EPAs but not to begin measurement of EPAs in phase one. Um, in phase two, we imagine, again, a sort of parallel view where you're actually still providing some uh, decisions, summative decisions about competence performance in professionalism, in communication. I know the professionalism embedded into the EPAs. I'm struggling a little with how one pulls it out when there's actual problems in it curious to see what other people have done. But then we will start to organize the performance along EPAs and ask for summative EPA decisions. Um, we're not there. This is our vision. Um, our, this is just a typical, I think many people have this, sort of your competency substandards mapped to the different EPAs. We have the capability in our current system to be able to do that. And then in phase three is really where we expect to do the majority of true EPA-based measurement with um, in, in the advanced clerkships, in the interclerkship sessions, in our capstone course, in our simulation, things like that to actually truly be able to decide whether students are capable. This is just a schematic of how we see it. No, no, Competency-based assessment in phase one, parallel assessment in phase two, and phase three moved completely to EPA-based assessment. Because really, by that time, you should know about professionalism and communication skills. So uh, really, just lastly, our challenges have been really whether we're really indeed developing reflective practitioners. Um, our student satisfaction data, I forgot if I just slid past that slide or not, but I thought I had it. But um, our student satisfaction data is OK on a 5 per Likert scale. It's about a 3.6 for most of the domains. And in the second year, we've done this. Actually, in the third year, we've done this. It's gone up a little bit, even to some Likert ratings above 4. So clearly, any time you roll out something new, especially when it's about assessment. Students don't love it. Um, and I'm not expecting that. But we do hope that we can help measure whether we're making a difference in this reflective capacity of our students. And then I think we really have an obligation to look at whether or not our remediation efforts are making a difference. So if what we're doing is just identifying problems that aren't being changed, um, it's a lot of resources and not fair to students to do that. So um, I think that's one of the biggest challenges for us all. It's, again, resource intensive to provide the help the students need, but it's certainly our obligation if we're going to pass along students to residency that we say are entrustable. So um, let me ask at this point if there are any questions, and thank you.
Thanks. I, I was struck by your, the intensity of your portfolio reviews of both types. And you say you have uh, about 0.25 FTE for your formative portfolio reviewers, and you're also, I assume, supporting the summative portfolio reviewers? We are. We're supporting them with a flat sum. So they get, it's a probably about, they, they, they will estimate it's about an hour to an hour and a half of work for each portfolio. We pay them 15000 uh, dollars to do that. And are these, are the uh, faculty from which you draw the same in both groups, although they... No. Uh, so unless, not, not for the same student, but do correct. you have faculty that serve in both groups? I mean, it could be. I think, I think that's a reasonable option to do it that way. Um, we have summative reviewers who have been mentors in the past who are no longer mentors, or maybe we have one where they're in their four, the students are in their fourth year and they're, they're participating in it. Um, but typically, we have not included the both. Thank you for the uh, wonderful presentation. It yeah, that's a, a, a great question. And at this point, no. Um, you know, we, speaking of application to residency program, you know, we thought about, initially when we started this, I was all gung-ho and thought, oh, we're going to share this information, either the student could, which I would be hesitant that they would do, but, um, or we would as an institution in our MSPE and describe the process and actually describe and share some of the decisions. We got such pushback from students on that. Um, and at that point, we hadn't had a lot of data yet to say, are we actually really measuring this in a reliable, valid way, that we felt it was premature. We also talked to a few residency program directors and said, okay, if you get a student who has, you know, honors or high passes in clerkships, and then you see that that student got a progressing with concern one year in one portfolio review, would that concern you and maybe take change your mind about that student? And they said yes. And so I think that because we really at this point are valuing trying to um, support the student and improve the student. As soon as we start moving this beyond the decisions that are at Feinberg, I think we're going to be in a different situation. And I'm not sure that program directors are ready for that. I think as it, I don't want to be the first school. I'm not courageous enough to be the first school to uh, transmit that kind of information for our students. I think it could hurt them. Um, I think eventually, I would guess in the next five or ten years, I think residency programs will be asking for this kind of information, and then hopefully we will have a robust ability to share it and tell them, you know, it's based on pretty good data. So.